the New England Patriots at it again? Has Colin Kaepernick finally found a home? LeVar Ball stirs up controversy yet again. LeBron James comes in fourth in the NBA MVP race. Rondé Hollis Jefferson gets a big surprise. Is there a team to beat in the NFC East? And who is on the bench this week? All that and more on What's the 411 Sports coming right up. Welcome to this week's edition of What's the 401 Sports. I'm Keisha Wilson. And I'm Mike McDonald. Mike, it's good to see you, and it's great to see you, all of our friends. So let's just get to what's popping. In, uh, during an interview with CBS Morning, Giselle Bunchen, wife of New England Patriots quarterback Tom Brady, announced that Tom Brady has suffered concussions over the years, and the most recent being 20, in 2016. Now, eyebrows were raised when she made this declaration because Tom Brady was never listed on any injury reports of having any kind of head trauma. So the NFL did confirm that he was not on the injury list for any, any head trauma and was planning to contact the Players Association to gather some more information. Mike, I ask you, do you think that the Patriots covered up injuries to their star quarterback and will we see any more cases like this? Only the Patriots know, I think, whether or not they actually covered up some injuries, and only Tom Brady knows. I think what Giselle Bunchton has done here is she's done a service to football fans and players in the NFL as well because she's got us talking about concussions, which has become somewhat taboo around the NFL. It's not something that they want to talk about. It's also made us realize, look, we need to improve what the whole situation is in the NFL with concussion pro protocol. As far as seeing more cases like this, I'll tell you what. I remember in Super Bowl Forty Nine when Julian Edelman took a monster hit at the 10-minute mark when the Patriots wound up beating the Seattle Seahawks, and it was obvious that the guy had a concussion, but it wasn't on the Patriots who were hiding an injury. That was on the NFL where they failed to stop the game, take Edelman off the field and give him his concussion test. After the football game, he was referring to the CLC Hawks as the St. Louis Rams. So I don't think this is so much a situation as the Patriots manipulating the NFL as it is the NFL sort of failing themselves, not doing proper concussion protocol for some of these situations and it can definitely be improved. And the last thing I'll say is, hats off to Giselle Bunchton. I know a lot of people are being critical, especially Patriots fans, because this is the last thing that they want to hear. But the fact that people are talking about it from Drew Brees to Ben Roethlisberger and a lot of other players, it puts concussions in the spotlight, and I think the NFL needs that. Well, I, I think given the Patriots' history, um, their checkered history, so to speak, I think it's easy to think that the Patriots are involved in another cover up, but I don't think so. I don't think that's the case because, you know, with concussions, it can happen very innocuously. A fall, just a bump to the head. I've bumped my head a couple of times over the course of my lifetime. No jokes, please. Um, and I've been able to just walk it off. I didn't feel like I needed to be in concussion protocol. So uh, this is probably what Tom Brady has experienced because anytime he gets bumped, you, get, you can rattle the head a little bit, he can fall, bump it on the turf, but still be fine. And But over the course of time, with his wife, who has an intimate knowledge of him, she would know if something's just a little bit off. And in terms of um, whether we'll see more cases like this, um, I don't think so. Because one of the, I don't want to say flaws, but one of the difficulties in the with the NFL uh, fighting against concussions is the idea of self-reporting. You have to... The, the league is relying, in many cases, on players to say that the, you know, I have a concussion. And if somebody's not doing that, then there's, there's that gap. And it's not the NFL's fault. It's not the team's fault. It's just in a sport where injuries can happen and not every player has the luxury of having their job waiting for them when they return for injury, they're going to choose self-preservation and their livelihood every time. The average text takes your eyes off the road for nearly five seconds. At highway speeds, that's enough time to travel the length of a football field. Stop the texts. Stop the wrecks. Seattle Seahawks head coach Pete Carroll publicly announced that he's considering Colin Kaepernick as an option for a backup to quarterback Russell Wilson. While no final decisions have been yet been made, Seattle Seahawks defensive lineman Michael Bennett thinks that Seattle is the perfect place for Colin Kaepernick. Do you think, Mike, that Seattle is a good place for uh, Colin Kaepernick? And considering that Colin is still without a football home and there are quarterbacks who are getting signed to deals, do you think that Colin's unemployment still um, is furthered, the, furthers the notion that he's being blackballed? 
I think it would be a good fit for him to go to Seattle. I don't think that there would be too much pressure on him. He would be the backup quarterback to Russell Wilson. And this is a team that has proven year out, year in, year out over the last several years that they can compete at a high level. They have a championship to prove it. As far as Kaepernick being blackballed, I think that if he can honestly play, and he was a number one quarterback, a franchise quarterback, and still playing on the level that he was back in 2012, some of these teams would have wound up picking him up. I really do believe that. However, I think Kaepernick has certainly hurt his case by what he did last season by sitting for the national anthem. I was someone who was supportive of it. I think it was a great decision for him to go ahead and do what he does, do ahead, go, that went ahead and did what he did. I think the people that are being really critical of Kaepernick and saying maybe that he's second-guessing himself don't understand Colin Kaepernick. This guy put himself out there, all right, he made the decision to do what he did, and he's living with it. And I think there's certainly, when it's all said and done, I'll finish with this, Colin Kaepernick definitely has a career in, in social activism. There's no question about it because people have rallied around this guy. Well, I think for in terms of Seattle being the right place for him, I say yes and no. I think yes for the, the fact that he's already been, his protest has already been embraced by some members of the Seahawks. And I think Seattle as a whole strikes me as a really progressive city, a, a city that would embrace such activism on, on his part. I would say no only because his desire from all accounts is to be a starting quarterback and he will not have that opportunity. It's Russell Wilson's job and I don't see, based on his performance, that he can overtake Russell. But Russell has been injury prone so he may get a shot to get in there for a, a couple of games. In terms of being blackballed, uh, some people will say that he isn't because uh, Jay Cutler and Tom Tony Romo were basically forced into retirement because nobody wanted their services. But I'll say that he is in the sense that when you look at Mike Glennon, who was a backup quarterback who signed with the Chicago Bears for $45 million for three years, 18.5 guaranteed, and then you have Blaine Gabbard, who Colin Kaepernick took the starting position for. He was signed to the Arizona Cardinals, probably more in a backup role to Carson Palmer. He was signed. So... The person that Colin took over the position for gets a deal, and he doesn't. So, and then, you know, there's a lot of thoughts about his, his vegan diet, and, you know, Tom Brady is applauded for his diet, and this is wrong. So I just think that he, there is a little bit of blackballing going on there. Spurs fan is suing the Golden State Warriors center Zaza Pachulia and the Golden State Warriors organization for Pachulia's play against San Antonio Spurs star Kawhi Leonard. His play against Kawhi caused um, him to leave, that him being Leonard, leave the game with an ankle injury and many people think that it's because Kawhi left the game, it spurred a comeback by the Warriors and an eventual victory for them. So the suit states that Pachulia's play, quote unquote, devastated the quality of the Spurs' chances of being competitive and diminished the value of the tickets purchased by plaintiffs subsequent to their purchase, end quote. Does this fan have a point, and do you think that the case should move forward in court? Absolutely not. It's a joke of a lawsuit. It's an insult to anybody that practices law. This guy has no right to file a lawsuit. It's like me saying, I want to sue the MTA for making me five minutes to late to work because I miss my... You know, this, it's ridiculous. It's things like this where someone who goes ahead and files a lawsuit, which is completely unwarranted... Um, look, I feel bad for the San Antonio Spurs. I really think that they got the shaft here in this situation. In, in Game 1, it was a really bad, bad play by Patchouli. I'm not going to say that it was dirty. I know that that's controversial and everything, that the way that it's played out. But as far as this fan going ahead and filing this lawsuit, I think it's completely out of line. Yeah, I mean, I agree. The NBA found that there was no malicious intent by Zaza Pachulia when he played. And when I saw the replay of it several times, I couldn't even decide if it was an unfortunate consequence of a player trying to close out and alter a shot on somebody or was it dirty in the sense that that wasn't the proper technique? And people who are well, more well-versed in playing in the NBA than I, they had differing opinions. So if they couldn't agree, then I think you just let it go and, and call it, chalk it to the game. And um, I'll just say there's no need for this lawsuit to, to go any further because if it does, it'll set some kind of precedent. Do you, could you imagine how many Knicks fans will file suit against James Dolan, <laughs> Phil Jackson? It would clog up the legal system and just taking up resources that would be better used for more important lawsuits. <laughs> Thank you.
Wow, these are really good. You act surprised. Practice makes perfect. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of teens in foster care who don't need perfection. They need you. Keisha, I ask you, in a third matchup between the Cavs and the Warriors for the NBA Finals, who do you think has the edge? I'm going to give the edge to Golden State, and I don't need to go on a long soliloquy because I think the deciding factor will be Kevin Durant. I think he is the X factor. He is... They're going to have... The Cavs are need to have an answer for him and so far I think it'll be LeBron James but what happens if LeBron James is off the court and Kevin Durant is on the court who would take that defensive assignment and I think Kevin Durant has a lot to prove now this also could work against him and in, in the fact that he may choke in his first um, NBA finals and with the, the added pressure of him already joining this the stacked Warriors um, after leaving OKC, but I'm, I think I'm going to give the edge to the Warriors. Yeah, I agree with you. I think the Warriors, after losing in seven games to Cleveland, they're hungry. Both teams are hungry, no question about it, and this is sort of a rubber match in the NBA Finals. The thing is, and I agree, everything that you said, you hit it right on the head as far as the Warriors with the edge, no doubt about it. Kevin Durant, this is an opportunity for him to get to his second NBA Finals of his career. Remember, he made it with OKC back in 2012, but the thing is, for me, as an NBA fan, this better be good. <laughs> because you've given us these horrible NBA playoffs. It hasn't been that exciting. So I think fans finally have some something to look forward to with competitive basketball. I hope the series goes the distance. The average tax takes your eyes off the road for nearly five seconds. At highway speeds, that's enough time to travel the length of a football field. Stop the texts. Stop the wrecks. Welcome back to What's the 411 Sports. Mike, certain members of the media have the responsibility of voting the all-NBA teams and for the NBA MVP list. So Paul George of the Indiana Pacers was left off of any of the all-NBA teams, costing him a lot of money, and LeBron James was number four on the MVP list. Mike, I ask you, what do you think the media was thinking when they made these selections or omissions, and do you think that the media should have decision-making powers over... Um, something that is financially implications for the players. Yeah, as far as the all star, well, the first team selections and everything, and the MVP voting, I, we can disagree on some of the players that were chosen and everything. I think one thing with LeBron James is he's proven that maybe he's not the MVP of the regular season, but so far he certainly has been the MVP of the playoffs. As, and to answer your question, Keisha, no, the decision sh should not be up for players' compensation. Should not be up to the media. It's it's silly, and this is something that the NBA can go ahead and fix. The irony of it, though, is Paul George. Look, he probably wants. Everyone's been saying for a while now he wants to flee to la la land and go play for the lakers so for him even though he's losing out on some money here this could wind up being a blessing in disguise for him right he, he just punched his ticket out of indiana but he also has a chance uh, next year to make the team and then get some more money um in terms of lebron being off the list at being number four i think you know for me i think he could win every year a la michael jordan My, i mean the value that he truly possesses just when he laces up his shoes and puts and steps on the court is immeasurable. But I think what happened what that worked against him was the resting and then the Cavs poor play during the, the second stretch of the, the season. And in terms of being able to make financial decisions, I mean, the media making decisions that have financial impact on the players, I think that's very bizarre. And I wonder why that was even collectively bargain for it. It's part of the collective bargaining agreement. So management and the players agreed on this. So um, I think, you know, I think it should be more like your job performance, your annual review, where you and your, your employer, you have these goals. And by the end of the season, if you made the goals, then you get your extra money or you're eligible for this money. If you don't make it, then either you don't or maybe it's a sliding scale. But I think, you know, they really should do something about that because that's not really cool. Definitely <laughs> For not. lack of better words. Yeah. <laughs> mom, can we get some ice cream? Please, Mom, please. No, we're having dinner soon. Please.
You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of children in foster care who will take you just as you are. Well, the NBA draft lottery took place last week, and of course the Celtics got the number one pick, but the L.A. Lakers lucked out with the number two pick. And Keisha, I ask you, is it a given that the L.A. Lakers and Magic Johnson will go ahead and select Lonzo Ball with that second pick? All indications say that the Lakers will choose Ball. I mean, he's from the L.A. area or somewhere nearby. They think that he has the potential to bring the showtime back to the Staples Center. So I think that it's a go in terms of that. But I think the potential wrinkle is, the f if, is if the Boston Celtics, who have the number one pick, trade it to another team who actually wants to have Lonzo on their team. Yeah, I think this is a time for Lakers fans to be excited for something, about to be pumped up about something for the first time in a long time. And from my standpoint, I think that this is a given. You've got an L.A. product, a kid from Los Angeles, who went to UCLA. Now, granted, if they see that there's talent somewhere else that they want to go ahead and get, go ahead and punch that, you know, push that button. But I think, no question about it, you've got to go ahead here and make that move to get Lonzo Ball. As you pointed out, though, Keisha, this could be taken out of their hands if the Celtics do wind up trading that pick and someone else jumps in there. Yeah. So we're going to move from Lonzo to his father, LeVar Ball, and he is never one to shy away from any controversy. He fi LeVar Ball finds himself in the midst of a media firestorm after an appearance on the herd with Colin Cowherd, and he got it. He, Ball, got into a verbal altercation with Calhoun's female co-host, Christine Leahy. Mike, do you think that uh, you are in agreement with Cowherd's decision not to step in and address his sexist behavior on the show because LeVar did tell Christine Leahy to stay in her lane and, she, and that he would only really address Colin Cowherd? I'm not one that's going to go ahead and support Colin Coward here, but I thought that he actually handled the situation properly because, look, bringing LeVar Ball on, it's all about the ratings. And I thought that the way that Coward played this was perfectly because he didn't jump in. He let it play out. Look, let's bring LeVar Ball on and let him act like a jerk. He did. You wanted to bring him on to act like a jerk to generate the ratings. Now, as far as Leahy and how she interacted and everything, I thought that Cowherd played this properly. However, the big issue that I have with Cowherd, he always wants to pat himself on the back. He wants to talk about how he's the one that's putting women, that, that, that's giving, helping women get into radio. He's the one that knew about all these ESPN layoffs. So here's a guy, when he, even when he does something right, he can't help but kick himself, you know, kick himself in the back. Yeah, well, I disagree with you, Mike, on, on this uh, account, in that I it's okay to kind of let Christine stick up for herself, but I feel as though, as a man, and the men that I know would never let another man address a woman that they have a relationship with in that manner. And I, I think there was a previous history there, and I think Christine Leahy may have said some comments about LeVar Ball being a parent and maybe intimated that Lonzo Ball was scared of his father. And making stuff in, you just don't want to attack people's parental skills, their kids and their family when you don't know the intimate details of their life. So that already set him on edge. So I feel as though Cowherd should have stepped in and told LeVar to, you know, pump your brakes. Don't speak to her that way. And I don't think that if he did it, it would diminish her strength and her being a, a strong woman. It would just embolden her to, you know, to give her support. And I think he missed the ball. No pun or maybe pun intended. I don't know. But also, I just wanted to say that I find the setup of that show very peculiar. That is, Christine Leahy is his co-host. And like how we're sitting here, you're next to me, I can touch you. Christine Leahy is on the other side of the room. She, I mean, she almost may as well not even be there. And that's his co-host. So to me, that, that says something about Colin Cowherd and how he may really feel about women, and then you mentioned um, how he said that he knew about the ESPN firings. Well, there there was this one woman who's gone on record and said that her friend had a job with Colin Cowherd when he was an ESPN. And the idea, I, don't, I can't remember if Cow, if Cowherd said that he was going to bring her over to sports, uh, Fox Sports, but he didn't. So I don't know. He's he's coming out a little sketchy in this situation. <laughs> well, we'll we'll see. He got the ratings, and he, that's what he wanted. That's what he wanted.
projected fight between UFC fighter Conor McGregor and Floyd Mayweather. Is it going to happen? Is it not? Dana White, UFC president, said that Conor McGregor's terms of the deal are done, and now he's currently working with Mayweather's team to finalize the details. Do you think this fight is going to happen? I think it will happen, but the problem is with this fight. It has to happen sooner than later, because what happens is all talk, all talk, no action. The longer you drag this out, it's going to be a repeat of what happened with Mayweather and Pacquiao. My answer, I really don't know. <laughs> Mayweather is the wild card in this. He holds all the cards. Uh, he doesn't have to fight. It's getting what dollar amount is it going to take for him to roll out of bed and fight McGregor. But don't go away because when we come back, we are in a New York state of mind with our New York sports report. My new dad teaches me all kinds of stuff. I wouldn't use this one. He helps me with my decision making. Never. And he's even teaching me how to drive. And that's why cars have bumpers. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of kids in foster care will take you just as you are. Welcome back to What's the 411 Sports. Well, Keisha, we go to the gridiron, and I ask you about our New York Giants. They've made a lot of moves here in the offseason so far, and, of course, they improved in many ways in the draft. When the season finally does roll around, Keisha, in September, who will be the team to beat in the NFC East? Mike, I begrudgingly give the edge to the Dallas Cowboys. I just think because of that offensive line, it really gives them an advantage. And you've got Dak Prescott coming in for his second year, as well as Ezekiel Elliott. They've got a season under their wings, so um, I think they're they're not going to they're going to be easier to figure out now. His team teams have had time to study and prepare for them, and they did lose some members of their defensive team, so you could still score on them. So I give them the edge over the Giants, um, who did not really address their need at offensive line. But they gave Eli a shiny new target in Brandon Marshall. So I, I think that it's going to be a battle. Well, fortunately, they square off in week one, too. So we're going to see right from the get-go who really has the edge in the division. I agree with you, though, Keisha. The Cowboys, after a great season last year, I know they lost early in the playoffs. But this is a team that, with Dak Prescott now at the helm, they're set really, what, for the next eight, ten years with the quarterback at the quarterback position? So it'll be interesting to see how it all plays out. But, look, if you're a Giants fan, after making the playoffs, losing to Green Bay last season, I think that there's a lot to be excited about once the 2017 season finally does roll around. Around. Well, Keisha, we talk now about some basketball. Congratulations to Rondé Hollis Jefferson. His alma mater, the Chester Community Charter School, named its gym after Rondé Hollis Jefferson. So that's some good news for the Nets. And we talk about the Nets. What can they do to upgrade a roster that has really struggled over the course of the last couple seasons? And just quickly, as we go over the river and talk about the Knicks, what can they do? And Phil Jackson, of course, as the general manager, what are some of the names that he should be thinking about as the Knicks prepare for the NBA draft? Well, I'd like to extend my congratulations to Rondé Hollis Jefferson. That's quite an honor. And in terms of building the Nets roster, I think they're going to need some scoring. They did trade Bo Boyan Bogdanovich, Boya, as they used to call him. Um, so I think they need to replace some of that scoring. And, I mean, I really like what they have so far it's just a matter of fine-tuning it because there were little periods of time flashes of of i don't know brilliance or um flashes of potential that if with another season under the belt with uh coach kenny atkinson and really tighten up on a defense because i think the defense is really where they struggled a lot they do have some scores you've got some you got trevor booker robin lopez is, i mean sorry brooke lopez is coming back so um, I think that they need some shooting. I hear word on the street is that the Knicks and the Nets have their eye on J.J. Redick. And you know why that is of interest to me. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, he would be a great, I mean, great addition. He can shoot lights out of the, of the gym. Uh, the, the, Net, the Nets also have interest in a foreign player by the name of Milos Teodosi. So we'll see um, if he comes over. And the Knicks, they're saying that um, they're looking at Malik Monk out of Kentucky, who is a combo guard who can possibly slide over and play the point guard position, which you're going to need because I don't know what 
the deal will be with Derrick Rose at you know when it's time for a free agency and even if Rose does stay they would need a viable backup one because Derrick Rose is getting a little older and he's injury prone so they will need somebody to to fill in for him and then I mean if you're gonna get rid of Melo maybe you find the, the future Melo in the draft <laughs> absolutely and as you point out, I'll start with the Knicks you know as far as the names that they should be looking at a lot of them are people that we might be unfamiliar with as you talked about the guy from France who Phil Jackson could be covered and again, it all comes down to how they handle the whole Carmelo Anthony situation. Because right now, I think the Knicks are in the worst situation that they've been in a long time. So hopefully, it will get better. And in terms of the Nets, you know, I've, I've heard that Justin Holiday is a name that's been floated around. I think it comes down to this guy, Jeremy Lin. Look, if he's healthy and he can give them some minutes and play next season, there's no question that this team will drastically improve. And I'll end with this. Jeremy Lin has said that some of his former teammates, four or five former teammates, have actually reached out to him and talked about an interest in playing for Brooklyn. So hopefully Ooh. there will be a sense of optimism for the Nets fans as they head into this offseason. Well, you can only find out what happens as we get towards the, the end of this regular uh, well, the NBA Finals, which are just right around the corner. Yeah, and he's played with some really uh, great players. So ooh, let's see. Well, don't go away, because when we come back, you'll find out who's going on the bench. Wow, these are really good. You act surprised. Practice makes perfect. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of teens in foster care who don't need perfection. They need you. <laughs> mom, can we get some ice cream? Please, Mom, please. No, we're having dinner yeah. soon. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of children in foster care who will take you just as you are. Welcome back to What's the 401 Sports. As you know, nearly every week we put somebody in the doghouse or on that bench. Mike, who's going on the bench this week? Keisha, this week I'm putting Blue Jays outfielder Kevin Pillar on the bench. He used a homophobic slur in a game against the Atlanta Braves, calling out uh, the Atlanta Braves pitcher Jason Mott. This is something that's just completely inexcusable. Fortunately, Pilar did apologize, but the Blue Jays still went ahead, suspended Pilar for two games. He will forfeit approximately $6,066 out of his $555,000 salary. Not a good look for Kevin Pilar. Nope, but hopefully that money will go to good use. Well, Mike, we have to say goodbye to our friends right now, but don't worry, you can keep up with us until we meet again next week by liking us on Facebook, following us on Twitter and Instagram, and subscribing to our YouTube channel, all at 411 Sports TV. I'm Keisha Wilson, and on behalf of Mike McDonald, we'd like to thank you for joining us this week, and we look forward to chatting with you again next week.